Let there be justice for all. Let there be peace for all. Let there be work, bread, water, and salt for all. Let us know that for each, the body, the mind, and the soul have been free to fulfill themselves. South Africa is so crucial for the world in particular because of the story of apartheid and the victory, the great victory with Mandela. We need South Africa to work. It has to work and it's coming up now on 18 years of democracy. It's time to grow up, to, to grow into full maturity. And every South African, the, the world looks to you. Coming from the, the background that I come from, I never really experienced it into my own personal life. I learned about it and we read examples of it and everything, but it was never applicable to my life. It was one of those abstract concepts that you never really got hold of. It goes back to one, one thing that I always understood it as is, um, the Zulus have a saying that goes, umuntu umuntu ngabantu, which basically is a person, um, is a person through other persons. I'm from a, an age and a schooling at a time when there were lots of boundaries set legally, morally, and the word Ubuntu didn't exist. It's a Bantu word, which is pretty much it goes across all the African countries that do have Bantu existence. And in my understanding, to put it in one word, I'd say it's humanity. It's a very ancient traditional system, and I guess it's like a university of understanding. And what I know of it is, is, is a voyage of discovery in itself. Ubuntu is by far the oldest recorded spiritual philosophy. Uh, and it is a spiritual philosophy that was practiced by many of the sub-Saharan tribes that were you know, the, the, the first people to live in South Africa. And Ubuntu, in its message, is I am because you are. The people have been separating people from the beginning, you know. And to, to take all the distance they already put uh, among the people, to break all that barriers, it's going to take millions of years to do that. And you can look around and there's so much work yet to be done. Um, and we could focus on all the stuff that's not right yet in this country. But at the same time, if we just focus on that, we're not moving forward. And I think that um, as a country, we owe it to that man who did what he did for our freedom to keep pushing the concept of Ubuntu and, and, and freedom and forgiveness and transformation. The, the, first, the first theme for Africa Burn was tribe, and we described Ubuntu in there, is, um, is that it's, it's the coming together of our new fledgling community, but learning how to take care of, you know, that I am because we are. I got a call from Jeremy Berman, and um, Jeremy basically asked me if uh, my company or our company would be interested in shooting a project that he was going to be running at uh, Africa Burn called uh, the Ubuntu Mashup. Um, which was essentially supposed to be about introducing cultural diversity to the African platform as a whole. I decided to come up with the, the Ubuntu Mashup Theme Camp, which was going to be a platform to, to essentially bring new and old South African culture into the Africa Burn space. And one of the first uh, kind of groups that I connected with was the Mzansi Carnival. Mzansi has been going for the past 10 years. I love entertaining because it's entertainment is part of what I am, but besides the music, besides the art, what keeps me going is the energy that I receive from other people. One of the things that uh, they obviously do is, is, is carnival, so we realized that you know, we would be able to organize a very um, powerful carnival. I think music has an incredible ability to bring people together, um, specifically drums and percussion, because there's, there's a sense of freedom in how we create our own beat. What I find really fantastic about the Africa Burn space is that it, it draws you in, it invites you to create, it invites you to bring something to the table uh, and to 
work together with people to make that manifestation happen up in the desert. I then got connected with a, a lady by the name of Candy Hogan who introduced me to her husband who had drawn a sketch uh, that was inspired by Nelson Mandela. There was a particular image of him, just a headshot, but his head was tilted at an angle of benevolence, if I may say. You know, sometimes you need to see your subject, I guess, in, in in a certain environment, in a certain way, in order for, for that process to kick in. He said that he'd worked with a, a chap by the name of John Quigley, and they had created an image on the beach um, of a lion made out of 1,500 kids that are roaring for, for climate change at the, at the global COP17 conference. And, you know, we, I, you know I, immediately I saw the link between the carnival and be, being able to create this image. For me, it's all about something that matters to a group of people that they want to communicate and in a big way. And in this case, here in South Africa, getting the message of Ubuntu out and continuing the Mandela revolution of South Africa in a way that uh, re-inspires the world. A couple weeks later, I got an email from him saying that um, there had been this, this new thing that had been introduced to, to the dynamic, and that was uh, that through a series of circumstances and, and events, basically um, uh, various uh, numbers of individuals had come together um, to put together this, this thing that was going to be called Project Ubuntu. Uh, I got a call from my brother Michael um, asking me if uh, I would DOP on a, a project um, and he and his uh, company were shooting up at Africa Burn and uh, I'd never been and I was definitely very interested in, in going up and helping them out. For me, one of the biggest things is the non-commercialism aspect of it. A lot of meaningful things get leached out of our lives because of that impersonal exchange that happens and the, the expectation of something in return or that kind of, and, and when you start that gift economy, that brings in the immediacy. You ju it's just relationships. And as a result of that, there's the, the transactions of daily life, those transactions which impact our ability to form proper relationships with people are taken away and I think for the first time people go up there and they're able to connect with people not on the level of race, of social class, of material well-being, on education but purely from on embracing each person's creative expression. Uh, basically to me it's all about the expression you know. Sometimes you feel to express yourself among people of which you are comfortable to be around you know and then you only yourself like 100%. The solution for what ails us is a combination of creative activation and reconnection with nature. And in today's highly technical world, those experiences are getting fewer and fewer for most people. You know, Africa Burn as an environment is, is very hostile. Um, it can be very hostile in terms of the conditions, so there's a lot of preparation that needs to take place. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about the event is that it's not easy to go up to Africa Burn. You know, it, it does cost a lot of money, it does take a long time to get there, the, the conditions are harsh, and I think that is just the real sort of testament to the people who want to go up there, is that they're willing to kind of make those sacrifices and to endure those things, to enjoy the platform that Africa Burn creates. Early in the morning we met up with the carnival team and the guys that were going to be taking us up to the burn and uh, we met John Quigley for the first time. We're here in, in Africa, in Cape Town, on our way to Africa Burn to create uh, the image of the emerging face of Ubuntu. And you step to the left, and you step to the right, then you walk in the depths, and you move in the light, and you step to correct, to correct what is right, one remarkable step and you move.
going to Africa burn is not easy. You've got to have the willpower to go there. The thing about heading up to the burn is, is that there's 120 kilometers, I think it was, of, of dirt road going through barren deserts. And, you know, the, the whole way along the road there, you know, to the burn, I mean, you're passing people who've had a blowout or you're passing somebody whose car's, you know, packed up. And so, you know, you've got to make an effort to be there. The production team was in my car following uh, two overlanders that were heading up to Africa burn. And at some point we stopped and I thought to myself, it's another pit stop and somebody needs to take a pee or whatever it is. But we came to a stop and everyone started getting off the overlanders. And I thought to myself, if we keep stopping like this, we're never going to get there. But then uh, I realized that the reason that we had stopped is because uh, somebody's trailer had, had, had rolled and flipped and uh, jackknifed and basically we had stopped to, to help these people out and you know the Mzanzi crowd and they all like jumped out of the out of the overlanders and they took out their djembes and they started banging on the djembes and jamming guitars and singing a tune sort of like to keep morale up while the guys help these people uh, unpack and, and get the trailer you know turned turned upright again. You know if everyone just helps everyone else uh, you know, just a little bit every day. Um, you know, we, we, we could change the world completely. And um, it was an amazing experience for me. You know, when we were heading up, we drove with sun behind us and we drove into a thunderstorm. And so it's heavy, dark black clouds with heavy rain and then, you know, sun coming in underneath um, all of that. And as we drove into the desert, it was this amazing storm. The clouds were black and, and there was just this lightning as we were driving and we could see Africa burn the camp, like in a distance. To arrive to what we arrived in, was, there wasn't a dry spot. People were underwater. It should have been a somber atmosphere. It should have been. When we arrived in convoy with two trucks that we were traveling with, we were faced with uh, sort of one and a half meters of, of, of rushing of water that had, had sprung up out of nowhere as a result of a flash flood in the middle of the desert. And there were just cars backed up for kilometers and people trying to like get across this torrenting river of water that had come out of nowhere. It's pouring in rain. You're not quite sure where to go, what to do. Somebody tells you, you're a virgin burner, you must ring the gong. You get out the car and you go towards the gong and it's this structure that's been made. It's really, really pretty. It's like a, an outdoor cathedral type sensation that you get. It became part of, of, of something special. Just that moment of letting go, leaving all, all the stuff at, at the door and walking in as a new person. It was a start of something that I think will take me through the rest of my life. It's a memory I'm going to have forever. And I think everybody that comes through, you'll just see the smile start. You just see, know that they have changed resonance. They've left their stuff behind. It's um, you know resonance and vibration. It's like music and and uh, um, and, and energy. You know the, the the very fact that basically everyone gets is, is striking um, this gong when they enter um, literally means that everybody is kind of like it's kind of like tuning into the same frequency. When you give something without expectation of anything in return, it's, it's flippin' gratifying. <laughs> it feels really, really good. But, but because there's no transaction, it puts you in the immediate with someone. You're actually just having a relationship like that. You're giving them a cupcake, or you're giving them a large sculpture, or you... And it's, 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 it's a really beautiful thing. I didn't quite comprehend the fact that this was a... Uh, there was no... Um, economy so to speak because of the gifting economy my brother kept on saying to me dude you don't understand we've got to take everything that we need with us because there you cannot there is no shop you cannot buy food you cannot buy drinks uh, you know you, we, you, you bring with you what you need and as a result of that there's the, the transactions of daily life those transactions which impact our ability to form proper relationships with people are taken away and I think for the first time people go up there and they're able to connect with people not on the level of race, of social class, of material well-being, on education but purely from on embracing each person's creative expression and having the, the confidence and feeling safe and secure to express your own 
sense of purpose, what you find meaningful in a, sa in a safe environment. And I think that's what makes it such a, a profound event. I feel that you will get it nowhere else in the world where people like can be different colors, different races, different cultures, different, you know, attitudes, different vibes. And they come together and you, well, there was no discrimination. The people were just all popping and just having fun coming there and sharing the thoughts, even sharing what they have to offer. Or oh, it was like more, to me it was like more traditional, the way people should be. The Western world that we live in is hyper-transactional and it's also passively consumptive. So almost everything that you do, you just passively consume it. So you watch a TV program, someone's packaged that together, all you need to do is consume it. You, almost any experience, even a festival you go to, someone's organized a lineup, and all you need to do is purchase a ticket and you go to it and you've consumed that experience, you know. Whereas here, you making that thing happen, which means that you all own it, which means that you all connect it, and you're not expecting anything necessarily in return. You do know that you're going to get something in return, but that's not your aim. When you create the right platform for people to do what they do best and to express themselves, they take ownership of it. And you know the whole need for hierarchy and structure and for you know dictatorial ways of organizing people fall, falls away because people are all aligned on what they want to create together and they just take responsibility for it. I think that was so nice to see. We had the film team working, we had the, the carnival guys getting ready, we had John and his team coordinating and drawing up the, the image of the Deba and the place that we'd found. We're gonna go identify the location, the canvas of where we're gonna create the living Ubuntu. We have a spot near a labyrinth that I think is gonna work, so we'll see. The actual design is, is based um, quite literally on a water droplet, if you've ever seen a spilled water droplet. So it's the water droplet and the, the theory of the circle of life. And if you were to just follow the outline, you'd see that there's no beginning or no end to it. And for me, that is what Ubuntu is all about. That's what we're going to try and achieve and just send it out to the world. The nature of, of John Quigley's installations is that they can only really be captured from, from the air. We, as a production company, part of our contingent, part of our responsibility essentially was to bring um, a device up with us. Uh, we own an octocopter. In running tests with the octocopter, there was a break in transmission at some point, and the octocopter flipped and ended up crashing. And we lost the platform that we were going to actually use to, to, um, to shoot the installation. I woke up the next morning to discover that my brother had gone on, a, on a, an additional recce um, and had uh, been referred to um, a pilot by the name of Richard Southall who, who had uh, on occasion a uh, original, I think 1976, um, Bosbok aircraft. They explained to him our, our situation and uh, you know due to Due to the gifting economy, it was the kind of thing that you could approach the guy about and say, you know, this is this is what we're doing. What do you think? And he said, well, look, you know, you can you can have the aircraft in my time for free, but you're going to have to pay for petrol money because you know that's the only cost that I'm going to actually um, incur. So I took that back to um, my brother and to Jeremy, and Jeremy said, no problem, I'll I'll pay the bucks. And and so there it was. We we ended up. Um, well, you know, with the perfect shooting platform, literally a military reconnaissance plan that is designed for aerial photography. Here we are using an ex-apartheid um, era military reconnaissance plan that was used for, you know, spotting the enemy um, and terrorists and um, all that sort of stuff. And now it's being used in a role of reconciliation, which, uh, you know, everyone is over the moon about because it sort of like brought the whole thing full circle, which was nice. There's me and my camera, and I'm, you know, I'm capturing what I'm seeing, but I'm the objective eye. I just have no idea where it's going, what it's actually about. And as I was shooting content, I started to realize who people were and why they were there. And it was like the Mzanzi Carnival, for instance. They became instrumental in essentially drawing all 
the public into partaking in, in the installation because there was no invitation or list of people. And the way we crafted it was the, the carnival was about gathering the tribe. And then from there, the, the opening circle to kind of ground about what was going to occur. And then a flowing into Ubuntu, this idea of, of human rivers flowing into Ubuntu. And then once they were in position, the idea was to get as still as possible, as quiet as possible, to embody Ubuntu, and then to begin the process of the rising up, which then would then go into the ethers as, as flowering seeds. So each, each one, by the end of the event, would become a messenger of Ubuntu. We agreed that at two o'clock we were gonna start the carnival and at three o'clock we we're going to take the image. No one really knew what was going to happen from there and at two o'clock I looked quite nervously over at the Ubuntu mashup space and I think I saw ten people uh, standing outside but slowly but surely the carnival started and it did a sort of a circle around the binnacle and within sort of half an hour we had 1500 people uh, all celebrating, all playing music together, all walking in the same direction. It was literally creating an environment using music to create a tone of energy um, that drew people in purely with, with uh, you know, just interest and, and uh, in an inquisitive nature that drew them into this carnival. I had no idea about the Ubuntu thing. So I was not aware of what was happening or behind the scenes at all. I just went and joined in because Jembe drums are, the rhythm of them is my favorite. My body just needs to move and dance. So I joined in right in the front and danced this whole procession. Music has an incredible ability to bring people together um, specifically drums and percussion because there's, there's a sense of freedom in how we create our own beat. When you have a group of people feeling free to do that, that creates an opportunity for people to kind of celebrate themselves through each other and I guess the essence of Ubuntu, I am because we are, it's, it's just a marriage made in heaven. What the Cornwall and the live drumming brought was we brought atmosphere, we brought a presence of walking together, marching together for one common goal, you know. And that is what Cornwall does to communities. It brings people from all walks of life, from all areas together and to march as one. Um, and everyone brought their own thing and that diversity created the community and the community created the diversity. So the diversity is, is extremely important in the community because you open it up to everyone. And that was very important for me, like everyone could take part. There was no prerequisition about who needed to be there or they were looking for a certain type of person. That image was the one common thing that no matter who we are, we all could relate to. After all, it was Freedom Day and we were all celebrating our freedom to be who we are. That image broke all of our fears and it broke all of our negativity that we had within us and it made us focus on one common goal. When people from different backgrounds, from different uh, cultures come together to create, there's a sort of magical process that occurs where with that common goal, the differences fade away. And I think that's the goal of this piece and, and the nature of this medium itself is to bring people together in a very literal, physical way where they become a part of something larger than their individual selves. As I saw people arriving, I just, you know, I got quite emotional to just see everyone coming towards the sort of the photo site. Where I was kind of standing, being, you know, doing the music, I wasn't privy to, you know, the whole of John's process. Because we were on ground level, we couldn't really see what the image looked like. We just had to trust John and we had to trust each other. They were just looking good. The guy got so excited when, he, when the airplane started making passes over us. And, he, and you could hear in his, in his voice that he was so excited and nervous at the same time that it was actually happening, that all this time he, he just wanted everything to be perfect. You're watching this Bosbok aircraft fly overhead and seeing it kind of take, you know, the photo of the crowd as we did the sort of the universal R was a, a kind of a very powerful moment for me. The beauty and the power of this image comes because of the piece that everybody played in this mosaic. And so the time has come now to really see ourselves as a change agents as a unique vessel for the change that needs to happen. That was a huge thing for me when I realized, you know what, I'm part of something that's bigger than me, bigger than Africa Burn. I hope to share this experience with other people, not only here, but, but with people around me that I, that I live with, um, with my greater family, just to trust people, to trust me and I'll trust you. And together we can do so much more if you just trust someone and deliver on the trust. I think Madiba did that with the whole nation in his, in his, in his way of becoming this great icon. I mean, he's worldwide. He's world known. He's world. He's loved all over. And by choosing his face, it helped with the whole "I love my neighbor."
no matter who you are, where you come from. If I can take that essential spirit with me and spread it, then we've all done we've all done well. There's a word called Sangacha Twam, like let's move forward together, let's progress together. Uh, there is enough capacity for that to happen if every person just woke up to this idea of Ubuntu. You know, I hope to be able to use that image as a storytelling piece that will um, fuel the, the, the kind of excitement and the energy and the connection and the inspiration. I think inspiration is a real key thing that we should be bringing back and sharing with, with others. It's a never-ending circle. It's an unbroken chain. So literally, if you took one person out of that image, it would break the chain. And just remembering that, and sometimes people get down on themselves. I get hard on myself. I know a lot of people do. But every person is crucial in this process because without that, the circle is not complete. Step to the left and I'll step to the right Then you walked in the depths, now you move in the light And you step to correct, to correct what is right, right mm. And you step to the left, now you step to the right Then you walked in the depths, now you move in the light And you step to correct, to correct what is right One remarkable step and you move